My name is Johnny Lin. I am uh, one of the statistical consultants at IDRI. You may or may not have taken my seminars before. So that's why I kind of want to get a little bit of background knowledge about you. This is the thing with this seminar. It's basically a, a kind of a new form um, that we're trying to experiment with, which is an intermediate course, okay? So most of the time we've been kind of going through in introductory courses at um, injury. This is the first time we're trying kind of an intermediate course. So that's why in the title, I put intermediate topics in CFA. Now, if you notice, I changed the title because I want to actually tell you what the topic is gonna be. And it's basically, we're gonna be talking about latent growth models or LGMs and then measurement and variance. And we're gonna be using the Laban package in R, okay? So this is an intermediate seminar, I'm going to go over terms that I assume that you've heard of before. Now from the poll, it looks like some of you are introductory, so that's okay, you are free to uh, stay and you know learn as much as you can here. Just know that I will be going at a pace that is for someone who is intermediate, okay? Just so you're aware. I'm assuming you've read at least um, the CFA seminar I've, I have over here, and then also the intro to SCM seminar. Any questions about like prerequisites before we proceed or any questions in general? So the first thing I'd like you to do is to open the PowerPoint. So it's gonna be right here PowerPoint slides for the seminar on August 16, 2021. If you could open that up, and if you don't have, if you're not able to do that, let me know, okay? All right, so I am assuming that you have these slides available to you. Anyone who cannot access these slides? Will there be a CFA seminar? Uh, maybe in the future. All good? Okay, perfect. Okay, so if we're just gonna move on, right? So we're talking about latent growth modeling and measurement and variance in R, okay? With Levan. All right, so this is a brief outline of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, let me, so, so we already talked about the preliminaries, you know, we're installing the packages, um, but we're going to talk about also Levon syntax since some of you, most of you haven't actually used Levon. So we'll be talking about the syntax a little bit, cheat sheet a little. And then we'll talk about the an overview of these two things, two topics that we're going over today, which is latent growth modeling and measurement of variance. So in terms of latent growth modeling, right? We'll be talking about how to run this in Levon and how to interpret the parameters. For those of you who know HLM, hierarchical linear modeling, we'll be talking about the equivalence of the LGM or the latent growth model to the HLM. Then we're gonna explore how to add a predictor to the LGM and then how is that equivalent to an HLM with the predictor? What I like to do is also incorporate a mix of quizzes and exercises into the seminar so that um, it enhances your learning and engagement. The second part of the seminar where we talk about is measurement and variance. We'll be exploring single versus multi-group CFA. And then I'll talk about the four fundamental models in measurement and variance, which is configural, metric, scalar, and residual. And then we're gonna talk about how to uh, compare these models to each other. If we have time, we're gonna be really talking about partial invariance, which is basically, suppose you can't make the assumption complete then maybe you free up some of those parameters individually, and that's called partial invariance. And again, we'll be making this interactive through quizzes and exercises. So let's just jump straight into the seminar. We've been through this before. Install the packages, load the packages, and download the R code. Now, this is um, also a preliminary step is you can import the data set directly into R because we've uploaded this uh, onto the server. So we are you're able to basically um, download it directly. 
using the read.csv command. And literally you just copy and paste the syntax into R. The important thing to note is uh, this little option here just for this HSB demo data set is strings as factors. It basically means that I'm gonna convert the string or character variables into factor variables in R, which allows it, which just allows us to do categorical variables. So I'm assuming you've loaded those data sets with no problem. All right, let's talk about Levan. So many of you haven't used Levan before, but basically it is a free program that allows you to do confirmatory factor analysis models or structural equation models. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, if you've used something like LM, linear model in R, you know, you can still do linear regressions in Levine. You just have to use this tilde variable, this tilde symbol. And then basically it's like, you know, Y tilde X. You've done that before, probably in LM. This one's kind of new is uh, basically is when you have a factor analysis, that's an indicator. An indicator is basically an item, okay, that um, indicates the factor, right? So let's say you have like four items, reading, writing, and math, reading, writing, math, and science, and they indicate the student achievement, right? So, so basically you'd have the factor here and then the, the items here, all right? So it's kind of reverse from the predict. All right, and then you have double tilde, which is covariance. So if you have basically a variance, it would be, you know, covariance of itself, right? Tilde one is the intercept. One star fixes the parameter. And it, this, this is, uh, I assume you kind of know this from the CFA seminar. And A star frees the parameter. And A star labels the parameter A. The last bullet is the unique part of uh, this seminar, and this is used only in Levon for multi-group models. So what I say here is basically I have a two-group, right? Like a two-group CFA, let's say. And what I'm doing here is I'm labeling the first loading A, and then I'm, lo I'm specifying the second loading to be different. Now, what do you think what happens when I say CAA? Well, that basically says I want to constrain the loadings to be the same across groups, okay? What about C, A, comma, B, comma, C? Well, that's a three group model, right? Because I have three parameters in here and I want to unconstrain them to be different across groups. Another notation is C, one, one. So again, that's two groups as well because I have two parameters, but I'm fixing, you see, notice that, fixing them at one. Any questions about that syntax? If not, we're gonna quiz you to see if you're paying attention. I know it's early on. So let's see if we can launch this poll. So number one, C2222 star X1 fixes the loadings of item X1 to be two for all four groups. And then number two, CAA1 star X1 fixes the loadings of the two groups to one. All right, so the first question is true. You guys, almost all of you got it, good job. And the second is false. Very good. All right. Good job. So you guys are paying attention. I know. It's going to be a long seminar. So it's good that you're, you're already kind of focused now. Um, if you need breaks throughout the seminar, we'll, we'll be taking some breaks, OK? So you can have time to process, especially when we're doing the exercises. All right. So now that we've gotten all the logistics stuff out of the way, Let's talk about the content, the meat of this seminar, which is intermediate topics in CFA. What are the two intermediate topics? It's gonna to be latent growth modeling and measurement variance. Just know that these are extensions of CFA. So they are a class of confirmatory factor analysis models. 
both of them, all right? But one LGM extends CFA to longitudinal models. Measurement and variance extends CFA to multi-group models, okay? Now, the reason I put HLM there, HLM isn't technically a CFA model, but as I'll show you, you there are ways to make LGM and HLM or hierarchical linear models equivalent. So that's why I put that under there. So again, LGM for longitudinal models, measured invariance for multi-group models. That's just a very simple overview. So let's go straight into latent growth models. So like I said, latent growth models model trajectories or trends longitudinally. It's a special case of CFA. All right, so does, for example, one question you can ask is, does the average student GPA in a particular school go up or down over time? And I'm talking here about linear trajectories. You can fit nonlinear trajectories if you want, but not for the purpose of this seminar. Okay, so that's a visual representation of what that looks like, right? So here, over time, it looks like average GPA goes up, right? It could also go down and it can also be flat. All right, so that's the main question we're trying to address. When you try to model an LGM as a CFA, remember that CFA is a multivariate model, which means there's multiple outcomes, right? And if you've done other analyses before, you know outcomes are usually separated by columns in your data. So what I'm talking about is what does your data look like? What setup do you need for your data set? Well, first you need the student ID, right? So this is the first student. And then you need your outcomes separated by time, right? So how many time points do I have here? One, two, three, four, and five. I have five time points. I like to send or start my time one at zero because it helps with the interpretation of your analysis. That's why I labeled it zero to four. This is the GPA for the first semester of the first student, the second semester of the first student and on. And this last variable is whether they are female, which I call sex, so sex equals one equals female. So this is a female student. And I wanna distinguish between this format and then something called long format. So this is called wide format. And then there's something called long format, which we'll need for the HLM, the hierarchical linear model. So this is called wide. It's also known as multivariate. Any questions about the content of this slide? You can feel free to unmute your mic at any time, or you can address your question via the chat. Okay, so it sounds like we have no questions. This is where it gets a little technical. So if you have attended my previous seminars, you'll know that I like matrix notation because it really helps you understand what parameter you're looking at. The good thing is that there are path diagrams that represent the matrices. So it's a visual way to represent the matrix formulation. Assuming you've attended the CFA seminar, basically what we have is right here, a one, two, three, four, five item CFA, right? How many factors do we have? Well, the circles, represent the factors, right? So we have one and two factors. The first factor is called the intercept factor. The second factor is called the slope factor. These are latent variables, which means they're unobserved and they're indicated by the squares, right? These are the five GPAs, remember? Now, uh, for each of the factors, we have a variance. This is phi, one, one, and phi, two, two. And then a covariance, this is phi, two, one. 
The triangle indicates an intercept. So don't confuse this intercept with this intercept, right? Both factors have an intercept term. I like to call these means, okay? So latent means. So this is the latent mean of the intercept factor, and this is the latent mean of the slope factor. And feel free to take notes on your own PowerPoint if you want. While I'm doing this, I'll be constantly erasing. So now, now the unique thing about LGM is you need to fix the loadings. So these are the loadings for the intercept factor. Remember in CFA, usually you want to estimate or free the loadings, right? But in LGM, you want to fix the loadings. And what do you fix the loadings at? Well, for the intercept factor, you fix it at one for every indicator. For the slope factor, you start with zero, and then you progress ordinarily up until you reach the last time point. So it's zero, one, two, three, and four. Now, can I put in different values? Yes, you can put in negative one if you want. You can put in 500 if you want. But for me, it makes sense to start with zero because the first time point is interpreted at zero. And then I assume that it's ordinal and that it increases by one. So you'll see the same factor pattern here where I have one for the intercept and then zero, one, two, three, four for the slope loadings. Finally, I have the residuals. These are the observed residuals right here. Okay, these are the observed residuals because they come from the indicators, right? And then I have the variances of the residuals. So note the difference between the variance of the residual and then the variance of the factors. Okay, they're not the same thing. Okay, so this is basically what I said before, except now I wrote it out in terms of a system of equations, right? Instead of the matrix, we're just gonna see a system of equations. This is to emphasize the fact that the observed intercepts are zero. So right here, Tau is the observed intercept, all right? I didn't draw that into the diagram. Otherwise, I could have drawn like one star or one triangle and then did all these arrows up there, right? But we're not going to do that because it's just too many parameters here. But basically, we have to assume that the observed intercepts are zero, okay? And what does this look like? Well, these are basically the lambda. Remember that lambda matrix? Okay. And then again, these are the observed residuals. Remember, this is the variance of the intercept factor. This is the variance of the slope factor. And this is the covariance of the intercept and slope factor. This matrix is called phi and it's symmetric, meaning phi two one is the same as phi one two. So we leave that out. If this doesn't make sense to you yet, we're going to be looking at the code, and hopefully that'll make a little more sense. But if you know me, then you know I like having the matrix formulations before I look into the code. All right. Any questions before we jump into Levan? The main thing you need for LGM and Levan is this growth function right here. Okay. But before we fit that growth function, we need to tell Levan what our actual model is. That's why it's called M1 right here. M1 meaning model one. Does this look familiar to you now that you know the matrix notation? Well, we notice the one, 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 one. That's the same as that lambda matrix, right? Right? And then this is zero, one, two, three, four. This is the same as that lambda matrix where we constrain the loadings in the slope factor. Not too bad, right? And we know where these come from. These come from the data set. Not too bad, right? From the Levan syntax cheat sheet, we know that this is an indicator. So, or because this is a CFA, 
these are indicators of the latent intercept factor, and these are indicators of the latent slope factor. Any questions about how to specify an LGM in Levon? At least a basic one. Okay. Keep in mind that we're using the wide version of the data set or the multivariate version. The first thing you want to note is when you see the output using summary, you can see these. We've seen these before. How do we know they're fixed parameters and not free parameters? Well, there's no standard error for any of these, All right? So that's how we know they're fixed. Anytime you don't see a standard error, you know they're fixed. That means these are fixed too. What are these? These are the observed intercepts or the tau's, right? So from the prior model, which part is that? It's either right here or it's right here. Remember these are fixed at zero. Okay, so then how do we know they're fixed? Well, the standard error is empty, right? These are the taus. So that's the unique thing about LGM is that these are fixed at zero. What are these? These are the intercepts or means, right? That kappa of the intercept and slope. So this is the mean slope. I mean, sorry, mean, this is the intercept at time zero, right? So what does that mean? It's the GPA of all the average GPA across the school for all students in the first semester, because we coded first semester GPA zero. So that's 2.6, like a C average, okay? That's pretty expected, right? Now, what is this S? So that's the kappa two, right? That's the mean of the slope. The estimate is 0.104. So for every semester increase, I expect GPA to increase on average 0.1 points, GPA units. So what's the GPA for someone in the second semester? Well then 2.6 plus 0.104, what is that? It's 2.7, right? So that's the one in the second semester. And you can go on and on for the third and the fourth and the fifth semester. Any questions about that? Okay, so we've looked at the kappas, the beans, right? Now we're looking at the, inter the, the variances. We looked at the intercepts, now we're looking at the variances. The dot in front of these means these are residuals. Okay, so you notice that dot here. So what are these? These are the residual variances of the observed indicators, right? These are theta delta. If you look at the path diagram, you'll see what theta deltas are. Now, these don't have dots, right? If they don't have dots, they're not residual variances, they're just variances. So this is the variance of the intercept. This is the variance of the slope. Finally, we have the covariance of the intercept and slope and it looks like it's zero. So maybe you can think about what a positive covariance would imply. The covariance is between the intercept and the slope. We'll let you think about that for the quiz. And then finally, you'll notice this. You'll see this like negative estimate, and then you'll see a warning here if you run it. Some estimated variances are negative. Well, variances have to be positive, right? 
So there's something off about this estimate right here. So this is called a Haywood case, H-E-A-H-E-Y-W-O-O-D, Haywood. We won't talk about how to resolve them, but I'll show you when we do some constrictions to match it with HLM, this will be okay. But typically you do not want to have a negative variance. Any questions? All right, let's make sure you understand what I just said, um, if you don't mind. I'm gonna administer the second quiz. So the first question is, in a latent growth model, the observed intercepts are constrained to be zero, but the latent intercepts are unconstrained to be free. The second question is, suppose the mean of the slope are positive. A positive covariance between the intercept and slope means that for lower values of starting GPA, the weaker the linear increase in GPA over time. I'll give you a couple minutes, maybe one or two. Okay, 10 more seconds. And five, four, three, two, and one. I feel like these are kind of hard questions. Okay, so which one is it? Is it true or false? Okay, let's go over it. Okay, in an LGM, the observed intercepts are constrained to be zero, but the latent inter intercepts are unconstrained to be free. That is true. And then secondly, suppose the mean of the slope were positive, a positive covariance between the intercept and slope means that for lower values of starting GPA, the weaker the linear increase in GPA over time. That is also true. Okay, so this, this must have been a hard quiz. Okay, so let's go over the first one again. The observed intercept, do you guys remember what that is? I'm gonna go over the path diagram again. So probably because I didn't emphasize where it is in the path diagram, but the observed intercepts are the tau. The other way you can look at it is this right here. These are the tau, right? Those are the observed intercepts. If I drew these properly, you should see a one here pointing at each of those indicators, All right? I didn't draw that here because I wanted to save space. Where are the latent intercepts? Where's the other one? The latent intercept is right here. Because remember the latent is the circle right here. The latent intercepts are the kappa one and the kappa two. Those are not constrained to be equal, um, zero, right? How else can we know from the output that they're not constrained to be zero? Where in the output do I see it being estimated and not zero? Remember, if I don't have a standard error, it means it's fixed. If I do have a standard error, it's estimated. So which, where are the latent means for the intercept and slope? You see that? That's latent means for the intercept and slope. Where are the observed intercepts? These are fixed at zero because there's no standard error. Let's go back to the question. In a latent growth model, the observed intercepts are constrained to be zero, but the latent intercepts are unconstrained to be free. Do you all agree that it's true? If not, oh, Joni's here. Hi, Joni. Um, good to see you. Okay, so does that make sense now? To uh, all of you guys, number one, if not, speak up or forever, forever hold your peace. Okay, good. All right, let's look at the second one. Suppose the mean of the slope were positive. This one's kind of tricky, okay? So uh, remember I said the covariance was zero here and what would a positive covariance imply? Well, let's look at the scatter plot, let's say. 
Okay. So then um, let's look, let's say this is the slope and then this is the intercept. What would a positive covariance look like? Well, it would look kind of like this, right? So higher values lead to higher slope. So higher intercepts lead to higher slopes. Lower intercepts lead to lower slopes. Does that make sense, you guys? And that's why that is true. So the more positive, the higher your starting uh, GPA, the sharper your increase over time, the lower your starting GPA, the lower your increase over time. Is that true for our particular model though? It is not true because the estimate is zero. So it looks more like this. Okay, so there's no relationship between the intercept, starting intercept GPA and the slope. Any questions about the quiz? I know that was kind of hard. And again, this is an intermediate level class, so I don't expect you to get everything, but hopefully you're learning. All right, great. Okay, so if you thought that was technical, we're gonna get a little more technical because we're gonna be talking about the HLM. And I'm assuming here that you have some prior knowledge of HLM. If not, just listen and absorb as much as you can. So why is it called an HLM? It's called a hierarchical linear model. Level one, we're gonna have repeated observations. So the time, right? And then level two, we're gonna have the student. Okay, so semesters by student, right? So level one, semester, level two, student. So level one variable is time, right? Because semester and time are the same thing, right? So we wanna have time at the level one that varies across time. Now, do we have any predictors for the student? Well, no. So if I look at here, we don't have any predictors for the student. All we have are the intercept and then the residual. All right, so the intercept, This you've seen regression before, the intercept here, the coefficient for the slope and then the residual. So we got your level one and your level two. All right. So if we write it out in terms of the combined form, this may look more familiar to you. This is more like a linear regression. So you got the intercept, the grand intercept. You got the coefficient for the slope. These you don't have to worry about as much. These are basically the residuals. But in, in HLM, there's two types of residuals. There's the level one residual, and then there's the level two residual. The assumptions we make about the level one residual is that it's normally distributed with a mean of zero and a constant variance, sigma squared. Level two residual, we assume that it's bivariate normal, right? It has the variance of the intercept. This is the variance of the slope. And this is the covariance of the intercept and slope. Doesn't that look familiar to you? Even if you haven't taken HLM before, this should look familiar to you because we just talked about it in terms of the LGM, right? That was the phi matrix, right? It's just the indices were a little bit different. Remember that? It's the same thing. The intercept, the variance of the intercept, the variance of the slope, and the covariance of the intercept and the slope. Well, how do you fit an HLM in R? Well, you need something called Elmer. It's part of the LME, LME4 package that I asked you to install. And if you've done um, hierarchical linear models before, you should know how to run this analysis. But if not, let's go over it. Remember I said that LGM requires that the data be wide, meaning you have columns of your observations over time. Well, now we have something called long. Long means there are repeated observations down the rows right here. You see how this is only one student, but we have multiple rows for that one student. Now, instead of columns, we only have one column for GPA 
And this is at time zero, one, two, three, and four. So this is their GPA 2.3, 2.1, 3, 3, and 3. What type of student in terms of gender? Well, this student is a female student because female sex equals one means female. You notice how that is time invariant, right? It does not change over time. I mean, what, there, there are cases where gender can change over time, but we're not assuming that here. Any questions about the data setup? That's why we need long, okay? So remember I had two data sets that I asked you to download? One is called wide dat, the other called long dat. We're using long dat here because we're using LMER. Now, if you've seen LM, you know that LMER as a syntax is very similar to LM. This is basically your dependent variable. In this case, a GPA. This is your independent variable. The only difference is you add this kind of random term here. So random effects. This means I wanna cluster those effects by the student. This means I wanna fit a random effect of time, the random slope of time. If I didn't want the random slope of time, I would still cluster by student, but I would just request a random intercept, and remember one means intercept. I get the summary table. First I'll get the random effects, and then I'll get the fixed effects. If you notice, this looks kind of familiar, maybe not exactly, but this is the variance. We're talking about the random effect right now. So, so this is the variance of the intercept, this is the variance of the slope, and this is the variance of the residual. If we go back to the, the slide with the matrices, which part is that? Variance of the intercept, variance of the slope, variance of the residual. Which part did we not discuss? the covariance of the intercept and the slope. Let's see where we find that. Well, if, I, if you see the highlight, C-O-R-R means the correlation. So actually what we need is the covariance. So this is not the correlation. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. This is the fixed effect right here. All right, this is the intercept and this is the slope, right? This looks kind of familiar, right? This is the GPA, the average GPA at time zero. And this is a linear increase for every one semester increase in GPA. Doesn't that look familiar? All right, so where are those terms? Right here and right here, the gammas. This is the intercept. This is the slope. These are the fixed effects. These are the random effects. Any questions about that? Okay. Finally, I kind of wanted to relate Elmer to LGM. I mean, HLM to LGM, right? But recall that in the LGM, the latent growth model, we requested covariances, right? Remember that covariance was zero? There's no immediate way to get the covariance. Remember it was the correlation? It's not easy to convert from correlation to covariance. So what I requested is basically this other function, var core, that takes in the model, right? That M3 model that we had for Elmer. And then I output it as a data frame. And that basically gives me the variances and the covariances, right? And right here is where we'll find the covariance of the intercept and the slope. You can verify that the other variances match what we had before. Now, you may be wondering, okay, so 
now that I have the covariance of the intercept and the slope, does it match the covariance of Levant? What do you guys think? Well, right now it could be rounding error, it could be something else, right? But if you notice, there's one thing that's different. In Levan, we have five residual variances. How many residual variances do we have in HLM? Well, okay, what I'm talking about is the uh, level one, level one residual variance. So that's, that's a good point, level one residual variance. How many level one residual variances do I have in Elmer? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so the answer is one, right? And where is it? It's right here. Okay, so I'm talking about the level one residual variance. This is the level one residual variance in Levon, okay? Notice we have four, I don't know, five, five residual variances. And remember one of them was negative, which wasn't good. But in HLM, we have one residual variance. So what do you think is a way to make this into one residual variance? Any ideas? It's related to the syntax. Take the average, kind of. But we have to relate it back to Lavan syntax. Latent construct. Okay, so this is already a residual of the latent construct, of accounting for the latent construct. This is an observed residual. So what we have to do is make them equal, right? Yes, Rose. Okay, perfect. Okay, so it's something like what Rose is saying is basically we need to constrain them to be equal. Now, it's not exactly C because that's more for multi-group, but that's a very good um, idea is that we need to constrain these to be all the same, right? So that's very close. And I'll show you how to do that. Okay, right here. So this is how you match the output of Levon and Elmer. Basically, this is to show you that latent growth models can be similar to HLM model. Right here. This block is the same, right? We've seen this block before. And like what Rose is saying, we have to constrain these to be the same. The double tilde means I want the variance, all right? How do we know these are residual variances? Well, they can't be latent variances because the two latent constructs are only I and S. That means by default, they must be the residual observed variances. Observed residual variances. Remember in the Lavan syntax, A star labels the parameter and then having repeated A star makes them equal. So very good. So again, we fit this into growth. And let's look at the output. Look at this. A, 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 A. That means we constrained all of them to be same. We still estimated. We didn't fix it at one. Now compare this estimate, 0.047, to which part of the Elmer syntax, which I put on the upper right corner. You see that? So by constraining the variant, the residual variances to be the same, but freely estimated in the um, LGM, we're able to equate it to the residual variance in the HLM. Let's also make sure that the covariance of the intercept and slope is the same. And you see in the blue, so the covariance is negative 0.02, and this is definitely not rounding error, okay? Does this make sense, you guys? So what I've shown you is basically that the LGM and the HLM can be equivalent models. So a lot of people ask me like, okay, so should I be running an LGM or an HLM? 
honestly, HLM is a little more modern than LGM. LGM came before HLM. So I would prefer HLM. The only situation where you would need an LGM is if you want latent variables in addition to the LGM. Like if you want to use the intercept and slope factors to predict another latent variable, that is not possible in an HLM, but is possible in an LGM. If you do not have that hypothesis that the intercept and slope predict another latent variable, I would prefer you to use HLM because that's more common and more modern. So a lot of you, um, for example, want to test the hypothesis that um, can gender predict the linear growth or the intercept, right? I, are there gender differences in the tra trajectory over time? This is where we want to add a predictor into the LGM. So we're back into LGM mode. And this is a representation of what your hypothesis is. So for, for, for our first hypothesis, we wanted to see if overall across males and females, if there was a positive trajectory over time, and we found that there was, right? Now we wanna use gender to predict that trend, that trajectory. And what I have here is this prediction of gender on that trajectory. And basically what it's saying is, do males and females differ in their trajectory over time? And this is like a hypothesized model. Now, I won't, I won't go over the technical details for why I flipped the um, direction of the, the arrows, but just note that um, I added this predictor right here. And then the terms are a little bit different now, right? Because, because by adding a prediction to the latent variable, these are what we are I'll call endogenous factors now. And if you've taken my SEM class before, they basically imply that the factor is now a dependent variable. And every dependent variable should have a residual, right? So now these are the, the latent residuals. And then these are the variances of those latent residuals. But you can think of it kind of as just the variance of the intercept right here, factor, and the variance of the slope, just like we did before with the, with the, with the phi, except now they're called psi, OK? And then this is the covariance of the intercept and the slope. So you, it's the same thing. And the output, though, in Levan, what are you going to see, though? You're going to see a dot, right? Because a dot means residual. So these are now residual variances and covariance. But you can think of it as the variance and the covariance. Everything else is the same. We fix the loading that one and zero, one, two for the intercept and slope factor, respectively. We, I just call these Ys now because these are now Y side variables. I won't explain exactly what that is, but um, these are the residual, observed residual variances, okay? So the, the same exact thing, it's just the, the notations is a little bit different. And if you take my SEM class, you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. So in terms of adding a predictor, it's in Levan, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so you see here, this is the additional code that we use. When I don't have an equal tilde, it means it's a regression path, right? So the dependent variable is the intercept, the dependent variable is the slope, and I'm using the predictor x1, which is gender. Okay, not too bad, right? It's just adding that extra two line. Now the output is gonna be a little bit different from what you expect. Here, do we constrain the uh, residual variances to be the same or different of the observed residual variance? It's the same, right? Yeah, exactly. Good job. OK, so let's look at this. You see how it says regression? This is because we use the tilde, right? OK, so what does this mean? OK, so this is sex predicting the intercept or gender predicting intercept. That means the start, this is the difference between uh, females and males in terms of their starting GPA. So would we say females are higher or lower? Well, female is 1. 
right? So females have an estimated 0.068 GPA points higher in their starting GPA compared to male, but it's not statistically significant, even though there is an effect. This uh, gender predicting slope means that the trajectory, the linear trajectory of the slope differs between females and males. And because females won, that means the trajectory is 0.035 points higher for females. And that is significant at P less than 0.05. So just to recap, if you look at this um, right here, this is basically kind of saying that um, the female trajectory is higher than males by what, 0.035? I don't remember the actual term, okay? Any questions about that? Yeah, 0.035. Okay, so again, I like to relate LGM to HLM only because HLM is more modern and it's more, I see this more in consulting rather than LGM. That's why I want you to understand it in terms of HLM as well. Again, we have level one repeated observations nested within students. Time is at the level one. Now these are the level two, right? What do we add additionally? Gender. Gender predicts the intercept. Gender predicts the slope. So exactly the same formulation you see in the LGM is actually how you frame it in terms of the HLM in terms of gender predicting the intercept and gender predicting the slope. But if you rework the algebra and you make it into the combined form, this may look familiar to some of you who've done linear regression. This is the intercept. This is the simple slope of gender, the simple slope of time, and the interaction coefficient for gender and time. Don't worry about these. If, you, if you've done, uh, if you've taken my interaction seminar, you'll know what this means. Okay, but basically this is the difference between males and females and males, the, gen, the coefficient, is the difference between females and males at, at, the, on the, at the first semester. This is the increase uh, in time, the slope for uh, male students. And then this is the interaction. This is the difference in the slope between males and females. If you've taken my interaction class, you'll know what that means. Again, we make the same assumptions that the level one residual is normally distributed with constant variance. Remember, constant variance is key. We don't vary the, the residual variances like we do in the uh, LGM. And then we have the variance of the intercept, variance of the slope, and the covariance of the intercept and slope. All right. For those of you who like looking at the code, this is it. What do we do differently? Well, first, we have to add the lower order effects, All right? So we have the time. This is at level one, but in the combined form, remember, we don't distinguish between level one and level two. The program will automatically distinguish it for you. So this is the level one time. This is the level two gender. This is the interaction with the colon of time and gender. Now, what's another way of writing this? I could also say time star sex. That'll be equivalent to this whole block of code right here. So instead of colon, you use star, and then you don't have to add the lower order. Again, we are fitting a random intercept clustered by student and a random slope of time. The data set we use is the long format, remember? And let's see if we get the same results. For the fixed effects, 
right? Where do we see the fixed effects here? 2.56. All right, so this is the latent mean, right? But the dot means these are residuals, okay? So because these are endogenous, okay? That's why we have kind of a residual. So this is implying that it's endogenous. But you can basically think of it as latent mean of the slope, latent, or is there intercept, the latent mean of the slope, and then the regression of the intercept and slope. I'll leave you, uh, as an exercise, I'll leave it to you to compare that the results are the same, if you don't believe me. All right, so uh, this is the last, I think it's the last quiz. Yeah, and then we'll go into exercise and you can take a break while we do the exercises. Okay, I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully you guys are picking up some of it. Let's see, uh, let's share the third quiz. Uh, not that one, right here. A predictor with a path to the intercept and slope in LGM is equivalent to the simple effect of that predictor, the simple effect of time, and the interaction of the predictor with time in the combined form of the HLM. Number two, one difference between LGM and HLM is that the for, in the former, or the LGM, the residual variances are by default unconstrained, but in the latter, the HLM, they are homogeneous, constrained to be equal. And number three, the LGM requires that the data be long, whereas the HLM requires that the data be wide. All right, good job, you guys. I think most of you got these, um, at least the majority. All right, so the predictor with the path to the intercept and slope and LGM is equivalent to the predictor, the time, and the interaction, right? That's true. And if not, you, know, you can look back at the combined form to see if that's true of the HLM. One difference between LGMs and HLMs is that the, the residual variances in the LGM are constrained, but in the HLM, they are homogeneous. That is true. All, almost every one of you got it. That's perfect. And everyone got the almost everyone got the last one. Remember, the LGM requires white data. HLM requires long data. Good job. And as I said before, I kind of like uh, incorporating some exercises into the seminar to, to kind of give you guys some time to kind of fiddle with this yourself. So this is also a great time. If you want to take a break, you can also take a break, okay? So I'll, I'll go over the um, exercise and I put challenging because it's actually kind of hard, but um, as long as you are headed towards the right path, you know, well, well I'll, I'll share the answers with you afterwards. So the goal is to try to match, in, remember we've been using growth, right? Growth is just easy because it does everything for you. But as a, as a researcher, you kind of want to know what you're doing, right? So in, remember I said LGMs are basically an extension of CFA, which means you are able to run it as a CFA. Now, can you run, can you first replace growth with CFA and just run it? Is that possible? And if not, what's wrong with the output? Then look at the path diagram to see, maybe am I missing something? Do I need to incorporate things? And you may need to refer back to the Levan syntax cheat sheet to see what you need to add. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, Hopefully you guys kind of tried looking into the exercise, but I'm gonna share my R Studio. You guys see my R Studio? Basically, I'm asking you to use um, CFA instead of uh, growth, right? So we've it's the same model, right? We we used before, except now we just replace CFA. Um, instead of growth. So what do you guys expect? What do you guys notice about the output? Okay, that's good. Yeah, the latent, uh, yeah, that's great sh shown. Um, so they should not be estimated to be zero, right? And what about one other thing? 
Yes. All right. Awesome. So like I, yeah, like Sean said, so basically these intercepts have to be constrained to be zero, right? So remember those tau's have to be zero and then you have to free those latent intercept and slope means. So how would we do that in Levant? Well, if you refer back to the Levant syntax, basically these are supposed, if you did it like this, right? If you had tilde one, that would be estimating the intercept, but now we're constraining that to zero. So you say tilde zero, and then we want those tiles to be zero for all of the GPAs, right? The other thing is we need to estimate the, the, the intercept for the regression of uh, I on sex and I on S on sex, right? So this is a little challenging, but basically you have to add one plus to estimate those latent intercepts. And then if we run this, let's see. All right, you should get the same thing. You should get these intercepts to be zero. And then these are the latent means of this intercept and slope. Did you guys get that? It might be a little challenging in terms of the syntax, but it seems like some of you get at least the idea of it. Uh, okay, sorry. Any questions about that exercise? Okay, if not, we're gonna go straight into measurement in variance. And that's the second topic of this seminar. It's like part two, basically. We did LGM, we saw how it related to HLM, we added a predictor. Now we're gonna talk about measurement and variance, okay? Which is a completely separate topic. So don't try to link them together, just treat them as separate entities. So just a broad overview of, before we go into this, a broad overview of measurement and variance. Basically, measurement and variance involves multi-group CFA, right? Basically, you want to fit a CFA split by different strata. Let's say you want, again, like female and males, right? You want to fit um, a separate GP, I mean, a, a separate um, achievement models of CFA models between males and females. Now, typically you don't wanna just fit like separate models, right? You wanna be able to compare the uh, latent constructs to each other, right? But in order to compare the latent constructs, you have to establish something called metric invariance, okay? So for example, like if you wanna measure achievement, right? Like academic achievement, and you have like math, science, reading, and writing, these items, then you wanna make sure that the items are measured equally between males and females. For example, if you have like some items that are like science and technology and like video games, you know, and you have reading passages regarding those, maybe that'll bias more towards male students, All right? So instead of, and then maybe, um, and instead of uh, being an assessment of like achievement or reading, it's actually more of knowledge about technology, right? So you wanna make sure that that construct is measured the same for males and females before you're able to compare them. So that's the concept of measurement invariance. So now we'll talk about the four fundamental models of measurement invariance. And that's one is configural. I'll draw that here. These are the four funder, uh, configural. Number two is metric. Number three is scalar. And number four is residual. So those are the four fundamental models that you'll encounter in a measurement invariance. So the first thing we'll talk about is configural invariance. So what does it mean to be configurally variant? Okay, so meaning it does vary. Well, it means that either the items, the number of items are different or the number of factors are different. So in, in the left-hand um, kind of uh, diagram here, this is male and this is female. And my goal here is to show you that these are configurably varying. Why? Because there's an extra item here for female. 
let's say this is like reading, writing, and math, and this is reading, writing, math, and science, right, for female. Can you compare the latent construct of males and females if females have one extra item? No, right? The other option is like, let's say you have, um, you, you have four items, right? But then for males, it's one factor. And then for females, it's two factors. That's also not configurably, that's configurably variant, okay? So configural invariance right here means that you have the same exact number of items loaded onto the same factors. Now, what can be different? Well, what can be different are the loadings, right? The, the latent means, the latent variances, and the residual variances, all of those can be different. Also the observed intercepts, right? So all of these can be different in configurable invariance. And basically each of those four fundamental models is constraining one or two more parts of these to be the same across uh, models. Any questions about configurable invariance? Just in general, this is very broad. I'm gonna talk about the details later. Now, like I said, the four fundamentals models are configural, metric, scalar, and residual, right? So now that we know the configuration is the same, and these are nested models, meaning like the configural model, will, uh, the net metric model will be a subset of the configural, and then the scalar will be a subset of the metric. So metric, as the name implies, the measurement is, oh, sorry, this is in there. Uh, when I say variant, I meant invariant. So you have to change these to see if you're paying attention. All right, so it's invariant, invariant. So when I say metric invariance, then I mean that the loadings are the same. You see the little triangle just means that they're the same, okay? But the observed intercepts right here are different. And then um, the residual variances are different. What's the benefit of metric invariance is that then I can say that the construct is the same for both males and females. The construct of achievement is measured similarly between males and females. But metric invariance does not allow me to compare across uh, uh, groups. So that's where scalar invariance comes in. You notice I said versus here. So scalar invariance fixes the intercepts of the observed intercepts to be the same. And that allows me to compare between genders, let's say. And then finally, we have Residual. Residual variance, like the name implies, sorry, I keep saying invariant, invariant, implies that the residuals are the same across groups. That's the strictest form of invariance, and that's oftentimes hard to achieve. That's just a broad overview, but we'll go over the details right now. Okay. So let's suppose we're just fitting a single group CFA. Single group CFA with four uh, scalar invariants. Uh, yeah, so scalar invariance, Allison, is basically saying that the, res uh, of the scalar invariance is basically saying that the observed intercepts are the same. The tau's, right? The tau's, yeah, are the same. All right. So, but we'll go over each of these in detail. So you'll, you'll see it repeated over. I'm just giving you a broad overview. So you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. All right, so let's pretend we're just fitting a single CFA right now. 
And we have four items like reading, writing, math, and science. So this is basically comes from the high school and beyond data set uh, of 200 students, I believe like 109 females and 91 males. And then we're assessing their academic achievement in terms of four uh, assessments, all right? And what we're indicating is this latent construct called achievement, right? So these are the indicators or four indicators. These are the four observed intercepts. These are the four loadings. This is the latent factor. And this is the four, these are the four residuals. Again, like I said, each one of these will be constrained in a subsequent model. To do this in Levan, remember you have to basically provide a string that indicates those four items and loading onto that factor. So we, we've done this before, right? Hopefully, if you've taken my CFX class before. Now, multi-group CFA is basically saying, let's say I want to split my data set into two, right? For males and females. That's literally what multi-group means. I have two groups. Now, how do I do that? Well, you can do you can use a subset command, right? In R. And what do I subset? Well, I subset the HSB demo, that's the demo of uh, H high school and beyond data set. I want to subset it for females, and then I want to subset it for males. And here we see that there's 109 females in the subset data set, female dat, and 91 males in the male data set. Those are the number of rows, and these are the number of columns. That means we have 13 columns or 13 variables. They're the same number of variables, it's just the number of cases are different, right? So what we're literally doing is splitting up that data set and rerunning the CFA. So this is the CFA we get for females. Okay. Um, something to note. We want to make sure we have mean structure is true because we want to estimate the observed intercepts of those tau's. Why this is important? Because we want to constrain them at a later time for a subsequent model. If we don't have that, then it'll be thought to be zero. Okay, so by default, CFA does not estimate the observed intercepts or the tau's. It constrains them to zero. But we're going to fit that um, CFA, the four item CFA, right? That's what that model looks like. And then we're going to say data equals female dad, right? That's the subset of the data set. Mean structure equals true, meaning I want to estimate the observed intercepts. I'm going to pass that into this object called fit female, summarize it, and then request the standardized loadings. So I'm going to show you basically, this is the chi-squared, this is test statistic, it's a chi-squared test statistic for females, and I get 1.093 with two degrees of freedom. All right, let's, let's remember that number for later. Now in terms of the estimate, right, we get loading for right, math, and science. Uh, why don't we get a loading for reading? Why is it one? Yes. Yeah, shown. That's basically the marker. Yes, definitely. So it's kind of the reference, but basically it is because we need to identify the CFA with the marker method. Uh, it's not the most important factor. This is an item. Okay. So, uh, but it is basically, it doesn't mean that it's one. Okay. Like you remember, it's not estimated, right? You don't have the standard error. So this is fixed at one. We fixed it at one. We Could we fix it at two? Yeah. Does that make it the most important? Not necessarily. It's not saying like, oh, this is higher than, it, right? Because we, we fixed this. Now that's why I requested uh, standardized loadings, right? A standardized loadings basically standardizes by the predictor and the outcome. Predictor being the factor, the outcome being the item. And here we see, now we can kind of compare 
the relative importance. And you see here, actually reading isn't the most important here. It is math. Okay, so that's why I requested the standardized loading. Now, just FYI, measurement invariance is not about the standardized loadings. Measure, measurement invariance is about the raw estimates, okay? So you should be checking the estimate column here, not for the, stand, the equivalence of the standardized column. And we'll see that in a little bit. So basically, these are the, load, these are the loadings the raw and the unstandardized for females. What do we do next? Well, basically we wanna fit a multi-group, right? Well, then we do it for males. Same thing, we fit the same model. This is the chi-squared for males. And try to remember that number. These are the unstandardized loadings. These are the standardized loadings. Now, if you eyeball it, what do you think? Is it kind of similar? Is it kind of not? Oh, standardized LV, um, basically I talked about it in my previous center, but basically it's standardizing by the factor, standardizing it to one, whereas standardized all standardizes by both the item and the factor. So we're not going to look at standardized LV because it's a little confusing. Okay, so basically what do we just do? We just fit two models, one for males and one for females. And our goal is to say we measure these reading, writing, and math reading, writing, math, and science items the same way in both genders, right? What does that look like visually? Well, it looks like that the loadings should be similar, right? You shouldn't have like negative 0.7 in one and then positive 0.9 in the other, right? Okay, so another way to do that is to just fit in all in one model and then run a multi-group CFA. Instead of subsetting, the um, CFA, we can just run what's called the configural invariant model. And we've seen that in the intro. Remember, configural invariance means that the number of items are the same, the number of factors are the same. Everything's except like those loadings and the parameters are different, okay, basically. So if you see this, remember that single CFA model? Basically, it added an M, right, for the males. That just means that this is unique to males. Males get a unique observed intercept. Males get a unique set of loadings, and males get a unique set of residuals. Females also get a unique set of these three things. In the path diagram, what I show you is that it's configurally invariant because it's four items loaded onto one factor. But then in blue, I show you the parameters unique to males. And then in red, I show you the parameters unique to females. You notice the N and the F. The items are in black because they're the same items, right? We don't change the items. That's configurally variant if we do. Like if we made this X5, that would not be configurally invariant. The other thing to note is that we estimate or free the observed intercepts, which means the mean structure is true. Remember that? The mean structure is true. Any questions about the configurally invariant model? Well, this is how you fit it in Levant. Do we use the same model? Yes, because it's configurably invariant, right? Now, what about the data set? Remember before we subsetted the data set into males and females, but here we're collapsing the data set into one, right? So it should be 200, 109 females and 91 males. So it's the entire data set. So we're running one CFA, it's just called a multi-group CFA. And how do we tell uh, Levan how to, multi-group it, well, we say group equals female. And this is the actual name of the variable, female. Again, we request mean structure equals true. Now, if I don't say anything other than these, by default, Levan's gonna fit a configural invariant model. 
That's why I call it configure on fit.configure. I summarize it and I standardize the loadings. Does this look familiar to you in terms of the test statistic? Let's re remember those numbers. Let's look at the numbers again for female, the chi-squared. 1.903 for female, for male, it's what, 0.719? Let's check if it's the same. All right, ta-da, right? It's the same, right? You see that? So literally, configural invariance is like running subset CFAs where the items and the factors are exactly the same. Now let's make sure that 1.093 plus 0.719 equals 2.622. I'm doing that on my calculator. Yep. So literally, the individual chi-squared sum together to make the model test statistic. All right. And how about the loadings? Well, you verify that the loadings are different from each other, males and females, but are the same as fitting the subsets. Okay, I'll let you check that. Any questions about configural invariance and how to fit it in Levan? All right, so let's see if we're getting this. Quiz, what quiz is this? Quiz four. Okay, so number one, any two group model where the intercept loadings and variances are set to be free across groups is called a configural invariance model. Configure, number two, configural invariance can never be achieved in a two group model if one group has three items and the second group has four items. True or false? Okay. Any two group model where the intercepts, loadings, and variances are set to be free across groups is called a configural invariance. Well, what if, what if I have, you know, like two factors in one and then one factor in the other? Right. So that wouldn't be configurally invariant, right? That's false. And then configuring invariance can never be changed in two models if one group has three items and the same. So you guys got that. That's true. You have to have the same number of items and the same number of factors. It just they can the parameters can all be unconstrained. So pretty good. The first one may be a little tricky. All right. Uh, let's see if I can answer. Okay. All right. So now we talk about configural, we're gonna talk about metrics. So remember, these are all nested models. So once we talk about one, we talk about the next one as a variation or a nested version of the one we just talked about. So remember, configural variance means we have the same number of items and same number of factors, right? That's true here too, right? We have four items and one factor. What's the difference? Well, metric invariance means that the measurement model is the same across genders. What do we mean by measurement? Well, basically it's the relationship between the latent construct and the indicator, right? Which are the loadings. You notice how the loadings are in green? Well, basically green means that they're the same across groups. Blue means they're unique to males. Red means they're unique to females. So you see this constraint here? That means that the loadings between men and or male and female students are the same. Not too bad, right? Basically, measurement and variance means the loadings are the same. Now, some things I want to talk about measurement and variance in general. Metric invariance is the first desirable model. What do I mean by that? Well, configural invariance is nice, but it's not desirable, right? Because you can't really do anything with configural invariance. All you did was separate the analysis into two parts, let's say for male and female.
but can you say that the constructs are measured the same way? No, because you haven't actually tested that. Can you compare the constructs together? No. Metric inva invariance is the first model where you can actually say something. You can say that the constructs are the same between males and females. So like a student achievement, we can say that, no, they are not, one's not measuring technology and one's not me measuring uh, literature. They're both measuring student achievement equally for males and females because the loadings are the same. But what are the limitations of metric invariance? The limitations of metric invariance is that you cannot compare the achievement levels between males and females. But metric invariance is the first desirable model. So you want measurement invariance. Do you want configurable invariance? Not necessarily. The confusing thing about that is that configurable invariance is the best model in terms of statistical fit you can achieve. And any other model that comes after it should be no worse than the configurable model. But it does not mean that the configurable model is the theoretically uh, uh, desired model. Any questions about that? I know that's a little confusing in terms of logic. So how do you fit a metric invariant model in Laban? Well, basically, it's the same one factor, four items. So it's configurable invariance still holds, right? Same data set, collapse, gender, male and female together. Group equal female to indicate that we want to stratify the multi-group. This is the new part. Group dot equal. And then we say equal, and the C means um, to concatenate. Basically, we concatenate the string. It's called loadings, OK? Well, what do we want to set equal? We want to set equal to loadings. And by, by that, we mean we constrain the loadings to be the same across genders. We still want mean structure equals true. Summarize it and standardize the loadings. Um, so one thing to note is the degrees of freedom, which we won't talk about too much in detail, but just note if it's like higher or lower, and we'll talk about that. And then note each of these uh, degrees of freedom, or sorry, test statistics, those chi-squares for female and chi-square, and compare that to the configurable variance and see if it's higher or lower. Now, what did we just do here for metric invariance? Well, we said that we want to equate the loadings, right? Did we do that? Well, let's check. For females, 0.866. For males, 0.866. For writing, for math, 0 0.939, 0 0.939, 0 0.928, 0 0.928. So yes, that worked. So you notice also this little extra parameter thing here, the label. This just means this is labeling parameter two. And the fact that they have the same name means that we've successfully constrained them to be the same. Can you do this manually in Levant? Of course, you don't have to use group.equal. You can set this manually. And remember, it would be using something like the CAA kind of syntax. So what should be different? We know the loading should be the same, but what should be different? Look at the path there. What should be different? Remember, green is same. Color other than green is different. Maybe you can focus on these things here. So we said the loadings have to be the same, but what should be different? Residual variances and yes. Great, Allison, that's perfect. That is exactly what is different. And that is exactly what we're gonna constrain later. Okay, so like a, like a foreshadowing. Okay, perfect. Okay, this one's really quick. Um, it's just one question. Quiz five. 
if the chi, okay, I asked you to kind of look at the chi squared, right? If the chi squared of the configurable invariant model is 2.62, then the metric invariance model must have at least a chi square of 2.62, cannot be smaller. True or false? And if you don't know, you can kind of like look at the output and just see if that's true. Okay, it looks like the ones that answered it understand, okay? And it looks like there's a lot of you who didn't, maybe weren't, were too scared to answer. The answer is true. The chi-squared has to be bigger for the metric invariance because it's worse fitting, right? So the, the premise is that the metric invariance model should be no worse than the configurable invariance. The bigger your chi-squared, the worse fitting your model. All right, so we've talked about metric invariance, and that allows us to compare. Uh, no, it does not allow us to compare, actually. It basically allows us to say that the construct is measured the same way across gender. But what's a more desirable model? It's obviously going to be scalar invariance, right? So like I said before, configurable invariance is not desirable. Metric invariance is the first desirable model, and then scalar invariance is the most desirable model. I'll argue that, um, but, but you can say uh, the next model is more desirable. But in terms of allowing us to do what we need to do, scalar invariance is sufficient. And what is scalar invariance? Well, remember, every model per, uh, after what we talk about is a subset or nested model, right? So from the configural to the metric, we constrain the loadings. From the metric to the um, scalar, we constrain the intercepts, the observed intercepts. For metric, we constrain the loadings. For scalar, we constrain the intercepts, like what Allison was saying. Okay. So you notice the loadings are in green. That comes from metric invariance, right? We already, we already constrained that in metric. Remember, metric, I mean, scalar is a subset of the metric. And what else is green? Well, the observed intercepts. Those tiles are, are the same across genders. Now, the next two things are meant for identification, OK? What do I mean by that? Basically, to be able to compare now the student achievement between men and women or males and females, we have to pick a reference group. So meaning we have to constrain one of the latent means to be zero. I'm gonna pick females to be zero just for fun. And what that means is that I'm gonna unconstrain the kappa for males or the latent mean for males. And that value is gonna be the difference between males and females. So if I have a value of 0.15, that means males have a higher achieve, achievement than females. If I have a value of negative 0.3, that means males have lower achievement compared to females. So just to recap, scalar invariance is a nested model or subset of the metric invariance model where we constrain the intercepts to be the same, but that allows us to identify the latent intercepts or the latent means. But in order to do that, we have to set one of the latent means to zero, in this case, female, and then unconstrain the latent mean of the other group. By doing that, I can make comparisons in student achievement between males and females. Any questions about that? All right. How do you fit in a Levan? The easy thing is now, now that you understand the concept, you can totally just fit this in Lavan pretty easily. The syntax is pretty easy. It's just understanding what you're doing. It's hard, okay? 
that's why I kind of go over the concept more than just like the syntax. Again, you're fitting the same model, right? This is configurably invariant, yes. Um, it's a subset of it, right? The full data set group, this is all the same. This is the key, right? Well, we already did metric invariance. Now we just do scalar. That means the loadings are the same and the intercepts are the same. When I say intercepts, I mean the observed intercepts, not the latent intercepts. And I say mean structure equals true. You definitely need mean structure equal true here because you're constraining those mean structures to be the same, right? You're not saying they're zero. And then you fit the uh, summary and then you request the standardized loadings. Okay, so here's the degree. Okay, so the degree of freedom now should be higher, right? Like um, because we fix more parameters. The chi squared should also be larger because we fix more parameters. And it's a poor fitting model. Now, what did we constrain to be the same? The intercepts. So let's make sure. Yep, 52 and 52. All right, so it should be the same across males and females for all of them. And what does this 0 0.10 point mean? Well, it just means it's because before we had P2 for parameter two, well, it doesn't have enough room to write the P because it's two digits. So then it's just, it's basically saying parameter 10 is gonna be the same. Parameter 10 is gonna be the same. Okay, so the observed intercepts are the same. Now let's focus on the latent intercepts. Remember, I constrained the females to be zero and I unconstrained that to be male. So for males. So are males achieving better or worse than female? Yeah, that's a good point, MH. So it's it's better. Okay, but right, because it's higher, it's 0. 0.152. But just because we fit this model, does does it does it necessarily mean that this model is true? Well, we haven't really even tested the model, right? All we did was fit the model. We haven't assessed the veracity of this model. So you can fit any kind of model you want, but if it's a poor fitting model, you can't trust the results, okay? So just because we, we make the claim that males are performing better in terms of academic achievement, doesn't necessarily make that true unless we assess the model fit, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, let's test your knowledge. Whoops, did I keep sharing that poll? All right, let's do, remind me to turn off the poll sharing if I don't. Okay, so scalar invariance is the first of the four fundamental models that allows comparisons in the latent construct across groups, number one. Number two, in scalar invariance, all observed intercepts must be constrained to be equal within a particular group. Okay, so scalar invariance is the first of the four fundamental models that allows comparisons in the latent construct across groups. That is true, remember? So metric invariance is desirable, but it doesn't allow us to compare the latent construct. Strict uh, scalar invariance is the first one that allows to do that. Number two, in scalar invariance, all observed intercepts must be constrained to be equal within a particular. That is false, right? Let's see why. Okay, well, if you don't believe me, let's look at the output. What I'm asking is, are these the same within female? No, right? If it were, it would be 52.164, right? That's not true, right? This is scalar invariance, but it's not, they're, they're not all equal. What I'm saying is that across genders, they're equal. So, so reading the intercept is 52.16 and for, for males, for females, and then for males is 52.16. This is equal, this is equal, all right? So I'm not saying that within them they're equal. 
All right. And the last of the four fundamental models is the residual invariance model. So we're building off of scalar invariance, right? This is also known as um, strict invariance because it's very strict. And I'll show you why. We basically constrain the loadings. We constrain the intercepts. And then we constrain the residual variances. That's why it's called residual invariance. So in green, the loadings are the same. In green, the intercepts are the same. And in green, the residual variances are the same. Do I allow, um, do I still have to identify the, the latent means? Yes, because this is a subset of scalar invariance, meaning we have to constrain the reference group, right? The latent mean for gender to be zero or for females, and then for males to be unconstrained. So anything you did before, you have to do again. It's just you add an additional constraint. So that's what I say in the bottom, right? Wait. Conceptually, what does residual invariance mean though? Residual invariance basically means that um, anything that's not explained by the factor, which is the residual variance, right, is the same. Now, I argue there's two cases where it'd be, it would be preferable or not, right? I argue the preferable case is basically when you have systematic unexplained variance. So if, for example, if it's like student achievement here and then anything left over because this is like maybe an online assessment or through like a mobile app or something, it's anything remaining is basically their familiarity with like technology or like using a cell phone or something. If that's the case, then you could re-specify this model as maybe a two-factor model, right? Where one is like... Um, one is like technology use, right? And then the other is achievement, okay? But if anything remaining here, all these residual variances are kind of random or unsystematic, like let's say it's like um, their mood or at the time, like they broke up with their girlfriend or boyfriend or, um, you know, like the weather was terrible and they, they had a flat tire and they, they like, you know, forgot everything they studied, right? So those are not things you would assume would be equivalent across groups, right? So what I argue is that if it's unsystematic by uh, variance that you're explaining, residual variance is not really desirable. And in practice, actually, this doesn't even really hold in practice a lot of times. So what I see in consulting is that a lot of times this residual invariance is not, does not fit. So what I argue is you definitely want scalar or strong invariance. You don't necessarily want strict or residual invariance. If you have it, though, that's nice, but it's not necessary. The absolute necessary model you need to fit is the metric invariance model. And then the desirable model for me is the scalar invariance model. The residual invariance model is optional, and it's probably not going to fit for you. Any questions about residual invariance? All right, and then basically all you need to add is this right here. Pretty straightforward. Degrees of freedom bigger. Test chi-squared bigger than compared to before. The only new term we have that are constrained is the variance is the residual. And remember the dot means that it's residual. So those are the residual variances. All right. P5 means, P5 means they're the same. P6, they're the same. So we, we've gone through this before. Now let's look at the latent intercepts. For females, it's zero because we constrain them to be zero. For males, 
it's 0.032. You notice how the effect kind of went down, all right? Because like you're by equating the residuals, you actually change the intercepts as well. Now, again, is this, is this statement true though? Can we say that um, after strict invariance is imposed that males perform higher? Well, yeah, after strict invariance is imposed, but have we even tested the veracity of strict invariance? We have not. Okay, so we can't make any claims yet, even though we fit these models, we can't make any claims yet about the truth of these statements. All right, um, so, oops, let's do a poll here. This one's only one question. Residual invariance is also called strict invariance because it constrains loadings, observed intercepts, residual variances, factor means, and factor variances to be the same across groups. So the answer is false, right? We, we don't constrain the factor means and variances to be the same across groups, right? Because we, for the factor means, we remember we pick one to be the reference group, right? So do you remember that? So as I've seen here, I've shown you here, the factor mean for females is zero, but the factor mean for males is 0.032. These are not the same, right? So yes, yeah, strict constrains a lot of things, but it doesn't constrain the intercepts of the latent means. Does that make sense? Because this is a subset of the scalar invariant model where we do unconstrain these, right? Or at least the male. Any questions about that? So we have two more topics and one is actually optional, but this one's very important. So at least, you know, we can stay for this if you have time. All right, so, and by the way, I appreciate you staying till, you know, it's already almost four. So thank you for your time here. Um, but. We're going to go through this topic and then we'll wrap up with an exercise. Okay, so like we said before, none of the models we fit were tested. So we fit the metric, we fit the scalar, we fit the residual. We haven't actually tested any of these hypotheses, whether it's true or not, right? So that's why we need to consider model fit comparisons. So uh, the important thing you note about CFA is that this is called an accept support test. Meaning that um, the model implied covariance is the same as the population covariance. So it basically means that the model fits our data. We don't want to reject the null hypothesis. Usually we want to reject a null hypothesis and like, like say like regression, right? We want to say it's not zero. In CFA or SEM, we want to actually fail to reject the null or accept the null hypothesis, right? we want to say that the model fits our data. Under the null hypothesis, we can use, we can fit this fit function. This is called the fit function. And the, it's called the maximum likelihood fit function for ML, maximum likelihood. Don't worry about this equation. All you have to know is the sample size minus one, sample size, let's say it's a thousand, it'd be 9999, 999. The sample size minus one times the fit function is a chi-square. So that, that's kind of what we've been looking at before with the model, model user test, right? We've, we've done that before. I've seen that before. Now, something that's unique to um, measurement of variance is called the equal fit hypothesis. So instead of just one model, we want to compare two models. Let's call it the fit of the model one F1, the fit of model two, uh, zero F0. Zero. Remember, each of these are chi squared n minus one, right? Now, if we factor it out, n minus one times the difference of F1 and F0, there's a proof that says that this is distributed chi squared with degrees of freedom being the difference of those two models. And I'll just call it chi squared D. This is what's known as a hierarchical model. Remember, it's not the same as like HLM, right? I'm just, this is a completely different concept. So 
you have the unrestricted model, and then you have the nested model. Nested means that you fix more parameters. So what's an example of an unrestricted model versus a nested model that we've talked about? Oops, forget that mark there. What's an example of an unrestricted model and then a nested model? You can, you, there's more than one answer to this. Yeah, yeah, metric is nested to config. Well, that's correct, MH. How about um, scalar? I mean, uh, unrestricted being scalar and nested being residual. That's also, right? Now, can you have configural being unrestricted and nested being residual? Yes, but that is not the chi-squared difference test. The chi-squared difference test that we're going to talk about is always in comparison to the, the one immediately preceding. So for example, you can compare configural versus metric. You can compare metric versus scalar. And then you compare scalar versus residual. But you can't jump from configural to residual. Does that make sense? And the more degrees, the more free parameters, the lower the degrees of freedom. So the unrestricted model should have a lower degrees of freedom, right? We've seen that before. Any questions about that? Well, remember, we talked about the chi-square difference test being the test of two subsequent models, right? How do you run this in Levan? Well, use this thing called LAV capital test LRT for likelihood ratio test. But basically this is a chi-square difference test. Remember we talked about the chi-square difference test, D for difference. The beauty of Levan is you can fit multiple models into the same uh, uh, command or function. So I fit the figure configural the metric, the scalar, and the residual, the four fundamental models all into the same function. Does that mean I test all of these simultaneously? No. Remember, this is a sequential chi-square test, right? So why don't you think fit.configural has anything for chi-square difference? Well, it's the same. It's, it's the first model, right? So there's nothing to compare it to. And then metric is the first model where I'm comparing it to the configural. The degree of freedom should be higher, right? What's the difference in the degrees of freedom? Remember, it's, it should be chi-squared with the difference in the degrees of freedom. So it's 7 minus 4 equals 3 right here. And literally, it's the difference of those chi-squareds, right? 6.801 minus 2.622 should equal 4.179. You should check that. Now for the next one, for the scalar, what model should I be comparing this to? Metric, perfect. Remember, it's always comparing to the one preceding, right? So let's check that 10 minus seven is three. And then you can check that, uh, let's see, 47 minus 6.80 oh, is 40.978, all right? Good job. and. Finally, the residual is compared to the scalar. Now, remember we want an equal fit hypothesis or the accept uh, support hypothesis. That means our p-value should be what? Greater than or less than 0.05? Greater. Yes. So which one's greater than 0.05? Well, this one right here, the metric. You notice that all subsequent models are significant, which is not what we want, right? We don't want to reject the null hypothesis because what we want to say is that this model is not any worse than the configural. Remember, statistically, configural is the best model, but the desired model are all these models below it. 
Okay. And what's the first desired model? Well, the first desired model is the metric model here. And we fail to reject, meaning we accept that metric model that is not worse than the configurable. But we do not reject, uh, we do not accept the scalar, nor do we reject the residual or we accept the residual model. Anyone have an idea about what we can claim then from this output? We can claim metric invariance, but like in terms of like the concept of what we can claim in terms of student achievement. Yes, good, Allison. Yes, the loadings are the, yes, that is true as well, Rose. And like Allison was saying, basically that we can assure that a student achievement is measured the same way between the two groups. Are we able to make a comparison between student achievement with this fit? Can we say that male students are performing higher than female students? Because that's what we found before. Yeah, great, great job, you guys. Okay, so yeah, we cannot claim that because we, we, we fail to accept the scalar invariant model, right? Perfect. All right, you guys are getting it. Okay. So um, let's see if there's one more. All right, this is our, I think it's our last quiz. Yay, you guys made it to the end. Um, but yeah, let's see. The, the, I'm talking about the output rest before this. You can go back to the slide before this. The row fit.scalar in the output above compares the scalar invariant model to the configural invariant model. The unrestricted model has less degrees of freedom compared to the nested model. And the, okay, this one's a little tricky. The maximum CFI, if you guys don't know what CFI is basically like, you need it to be greater than 0.9 or 0.95, but the greater it is, the better the fit, okay? The maximum CFI the scalar invariant model can achieve is the CFI of the metric invariant model. Okay, so, the scalar invariant model is not compared to the configural invariant model. This it's compared to the metric model, right? So you guys got that. Number two is true because we're um, fixing less parameters, right? Number three is true. The maximum CFI, the scalar invariant, because Basically, the scalar invariant, invariant model can be no worse than the metric invariant model. If it can be no worse, it could be equal, right? Or, or, or equal. Yeah, that's what I meant. So, uh, so the maximum it can achieve is the CFI of the scalar invariant. It can't go above that, right? Because it's a nested model. Any questions about that? I wanted to kind of go over the concept of partial invariance because I see this, and this is the Easter egg I was talking about. A lot of people want to use this because why? Well, a lot of times invariance is hard to achieve in practice, especially like residual invariance. I just had a client today saying she wanted to fit in residual invariance, but um, she couldn't fit it, right? And the reviewer asked her to fit she, she had to fit a residual invariance model for some reason. Well, you can do something called partial invariance, right? Partial invariance means I want to make, mostly make it invariant, but I just want some of the paths, some of the loading, some of the residual variances, some of the intercepts to be different across groups, right? And what syntax do you think we need for that? I know it's like getting to the end and you're like, my brain is fried. Well, the syntax we need again, oh, let's see if anyone responded. Um, well, marker method does is basically for identification. It doesn't have anything to do with partial invariance. Okay, you can do marker method or you can do variance standardization method. Either way, um, you can do partial invariance with that. So what I mean by partial invariance is that I want to make some of the paths or loadings different across groups, right? So remember, yeah, let's see. 
manual. Yeah, exactly. So remember the Lavan cheat sheet? We had this like A, B versus A. Remember that quiz you took? Do we want one or two? If we want to make them different across groups, one, right? Okay. So you see here, this is the key, right? By saying group equals dot equal loading, which model are we fitting here? Yep, one. And which model are we fitting here? Remember, this is metric invariance, right? Because we want the loadings to be the same. All right. So what are we partially invariant? We're partially invariant one of the, the loadings. Are we on the same page? What do you mean by that, MH? Oh, you don't see, oh, you don't see my slides? Oops, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And are we on the same page mentally? <laughs> Hopefully we are. Okay, good. We're on the same page. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So what I meant was, what are we fitting here? What model are we fitting here? Yeah, okay, good. Sorry, I wasn't on the same page. Now we're on the same page. Okay. So what does that mean? We, that means for the loading for reading, the loading for writing, and the loading for science, we're going to constrain to be the same across genders. Yeah, partial, metric, perfect. And then this, we're going to be different for the loading for math. Well, let's see if that's true. Writing, P2, 0.872, yes. Science, 0.932, P4, yes. Math, different, yes. Okay, so that's called partial invariance because we unconstrain one of those loadings. Now, is that, has that been verified though? How would we verify the veracity of this partially invariant model. Yeah, chi-square difference test. Do we compare it to the, which, well, which model do we compare it to? Do we compare it to the metric invariance where we don't constrain, uh, unconstrain them, or do we compare it to the config rule? Um, Okay, that, that's a good good kind of, maybe you can do both, but I would do compare it to the config. Because what we want to say is that it's not any worse than the config. Okay. The reason why you don't want to always compare it to just the metric, full metric, is because uh, what if that model actually fails? Right? So what you want to do is just compare it to the, the preceding model, which is the config. And then what do we claim here? Is partial invariance, metric invariance satisfied? Yes. Yes, okay, great. So this is useful because in practice, you may not get anything. Huh? How do we pick up the indicator? Um, you mean like if we had an indicator of one, um, but that's, that's a, a lot more complicated and I'll, if you're interested, I can show you later. But so basically what I'm saying is like, this is really difficult to achieve in practice. Like, especially like if you're talking residual invariance, all right, that's very difficult to achieve in practice. Now by unconstraining some of those, right, you're gonna lead to a better fitting model and compared to the config world, maybe it'll be non-significant. So what you can do is First, don't do the partial invariance model. Just fit uh, um, the model to the best of your ability. And then for the model that's not, the first model that's going to be significant, partially invariance that model. So like in our case, like metric was satisfied, but scalar wasn't, right? So let's go back. So remember the scalar wasn't satisfied? 
So what I would do then is fit the partial for the scalar and then see if you can compare it to the metric and be non-significant. Does that make sense? Well, obviously you don't want so many partial invariants that you basically unconstrain everything, right? So, and what would be, what would be, be un, uh, unconstraining in the scalar? The loadings or the intercepts? The intercepts, all right? So that's kind of the process I would make. I would first do um, basically the uh, non-partial invariant models. And then for the last model where I am significant, I fit the partial to my, the best of my ability without over partializing. Does that make sense? And basically we've reached the end of the seminar. Okay, I have like an exercise, but we're not gonna do it, okay? And if you have like time, you can look at the webpage. I recommend reading the webpage because I, I add a lot more details into the webpage and you can kind of read it like, um, like a book, okay? Book chapter. So I appreciate all of you for sticking it out to the end. You guys are troopers, the ones that have stayed to the end. I know that was a lot of information, but hopefully like uh, what we can do is we can post the video for you and then you can kind of process it at your own pace. And also you have the webpage available to you, okay? But otherwise I'm gonna stay for maybe like 10 minutes beyond 4 p.m. to answer any questions. Um, but otherwise, thank you for attending the seminar. I really appreciate your participation. And it sounds like most of you got something out of it.